Hi, this is Stacy from The Advisor, and today I'm very excited because we have a very special guest. He's been on our show before, and he is the amazing Savio Calemte. He is a transformation coach. He's had TEDx talks, and he is covering the glo uh, global. Is it the uh, glo uh, you're covering the globals this year? And I'm very excited for him. And he has covered so many topics and overcame so many obstacles. And today we're going to talk about con understanding who uh, and conquering our inner stranger. And so I'm going to give the 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 uh, floor to Savio and let him talk to you about actually getting in contact with your inner stranger and overcoming certain obstacles in your life. So take it away, Savio. Tell everybody a little about yourself and what you do. Great. Stacy. thank you again for having me back. I really appreciate it. Uh, last time we connected, I had my book, which then became a bestseller. Yeah. And to me, really all this means is that I took my pain and I found some level of purpose so that other people can resonate with it. Uh, so thank you for having me back. Um, so today, um, everyone, I'm here to really talk about not only my background. So I'm a stage three cancer survivor. I'm also a board certified wellness coach, best-selling author, as I mentioned, and recently a TEDx speaker. I'm also a media journalist. So I cover different wellness experiences. I've been privileged to uh, connect with celebrities on the concept of what wellness and illness is and what's the middle ground between the two. But today, I would really like to talk about what I highlighted in my TEDx talk, which is the TEDx talk is called Seven Minutes to Wellness, How to Love Your Inner Stranger. And I know that initially when I brought that topic up, people were like, inner stranger, is that the inner critic that constantly now, inner stranger is anything that you want it to be. Uh, for me, the inner stranger was my cancer survival story. That idea germinated with this idea of I saw myself physically dying because I was stage three non-Hodgkin's lymphoma bedridden for a week in the hospital bed because they had a nephrostomy tube that just, that took away about eight liters of fluid from my abdomen. Wow. And I just remember thinking my physical body is dying on that bed. Yeah. And that's, and then, but my other parts of me were alive. Like my emotions were alive. My, my, my connection to spirit or God or however you want to um, phrase it. My mental faculties were there. Cause I literally created a Google alert. I had my smartphone with me. Yeah. This was in 2014. And I just remember thinking to myself, how do I pull the physical body that's dying? How do I pull that and let it sort of regenerate or let it? Yeah. Heal? And so for me, it was a constant um, uh, back and forth. Uh, I was told by the medical director that I had to do my first round of chemo. Otherwise, uh, she said in her words, I don't know what's going to happen to you. Yeah. And so I thought long and hard. And I realized that for me, the answer was this middle ground. Um, and I talk about this phrase in a movie and you can hear that in my TEDx talk, but it's really about, I can do the route of traditional medicine, which I wholeheartedly believe is a healing modality and we should yeah. all look into it. But I also believe in this idea of there's other ways to heal the body. There's other ways to heal the spirit. And yeah. so I decided to do an integrative approach. And so for me, the inner stranger was really this idea of shame. I, cancer for me was a mirror into my own shame. I I didn't want people to look at me as less than vulnerable. I remember my um, mom and my dad and my sisters, uh, they were like, you know, we got to tell your cousins, we got to tell your uncles and your aunts. And I'm like, please. I, I said, I know that's what you want me to do, but I don't feel comfortable because I felt like a zoo animal. I was yeah. bedridden and it's not like I'm die. I mean, I was dying, but I wasn't like on death's door. Yes, right. And so I said to me, I didn't want to feel that way. And so for me, the inner stranger really allowed me to confront vulnerability yeah. um, and really try to rise above all that pain. And I left the concept of inner stranger nebulous because it means so many things to so many different people. Uh, so for Stacey, I'm just curious, and I know this is not normally done on your show, but how do you connect with this idea of your inner stranger? My inner stranger. So trying to figure out my inner stranger, I think it, the first thing that comes to my mind is pain. And my and the reason why I say pain is because I've gotten through so many obstacles in life that were not easy journeys to overcome. And it started at the age of five and it just, you know, I would have my ups and downs, you know, illness wise with my epilepsy and then going through other, you know, problems which, which caused pain. And it got to a point where I was trying to 
over, you know, trying to get over that leap where you just don't want to feel the pain anymore. And even though you overcome the pain, it feels sometimes it's, it's sometimes hard to escape that pain and trying to go through different coping mechanisms and getting through life. Um, I think my, my inner stranger is that, that, that pain that, that it, it, I have that resilience in me that overcomes the pain and gets through it. But it's that fear factor, I think inside, it's like enough. I don't want to, I don't want to have to experience any more pain. I've gone through it. I've lived it. I've overcame it. I want to move on. But sometimes even though we move on, things start to creep up on us and we have to endure it all over again, but in a different way. And it's, you know, it could be, it could be um, mentally overwhelming as, as much as physically overwhelming. So I, I think that would be my, my inner stranger in me is that fear factor of, of, of pain first comes into my head, I think. Mm. I, I love that answer. And it's really the work that I do. Uh, as you know, uh, I'm a board certified wellness coach and my focus is really about cancer survivors and what that next step is like, okay, this horrible thing happened to you. You're, you're out of treatment. Now, what is my life now? Like I tell people all the time, Stacey, like my cancer was a blood cancer. You can't see my scars. As right. a matter of fact, my veins were so good. I didn't even need a port like to get the, uh, to get the chemo. Yeah, now, they're, yeah, yeah. Now, now they're shot, um, unfortunately, but, um, and I tell people like, you can't ignore the fact that you lost a breast. You can't right. ignore the fact that you lost a colon or, yeah. your, or your throat or, or any other body part. And how do we live with that? And so that's my thing. Like, okay, this horrible thing happened to you. Now, how do you create that new version of yourself? And I just also like the fact that you mentioned this idea of you are much more than your disease. You are much more than the pain that life has thrown your way. You can conquer it all. But the first step is really sourcing out what's happening on the inside. Yeah. And uh, I go into my TEDx talk because um, there's a healing modality in Hawaii called Huna Healing. And uh, an offshoot of that is something called Ho'oponopono, which I mentioned in it. And that just basically means affirmations to yourself that you can talk to that part of your body or that part of that self that's not doing so well. Yeah. And you give self-forgiveness and self-compassion for that. And also exploring like emotionally what's happening in your life. Physically, yeah. obviously, we know what's happening, right? You, something's happening that's not too positive. Right. Um, but mentally, what's happening? What's your connection to something like source or God or, or universe or Jesus? What's your connection to something greater than yourself, like your soul? Right. What's your connections with your relationships with other people? Yeah. What's your connection with your dreams at night? So I go through all that. This, what I call the seven energy centers, the seven areas of life that um, really have meaning and, and impact. Um, and for me, it was just a roller coaster. I wasn't able to process what happened to me right. uh, until about five years later when I was able to unpack because I was just on go. I was given the diagnosis. I did the first round of chemo. I ended up having five more rounds every three weeks. In between yeah. that, I did Oh my God, I did a whole bunch of integrated modalities. I didn't care what it cost me because I wanted to find the path towards healing. I wanted to yes. heal myself. I wanted to figure out what it was. What's the point of saving an investment? Yes. If I'm never going to use it if I'm not there anymore. It did make exactly. any sense. Um, and so for me, it, it was really about confronting myself and figuring out and looking through what's happening um, with the process in general. I love that. I love that. Now, at this point in, the, uh, in time, what measures were the most effective for you to overcome and to connect with that that inner stranger and then to be able to move forward and to now, is it completely that inner stranger? You're very you're self-aware of who that inner stranger is. And do you put that inner stranger once you you you've met him, you've dealt with him and you have got in your affirmations, you focus on your affirmations you move forward in life. Now, are there any leftover pain from what you went through that sometimes holds on to you or leeches to you that in the back of your head, you might, you might be somewhere deja vu, something brings back that, that inner pain or that inner, you know, what you went through, you know, for your inner, your, your, your inner self. Mm. Yeah. How do you get through that all? Yeah. And, that's, and yeah. That's such an important question. You know, when I started doing my TEDx talk or formulating that I was going to do one, um, a really glaring statistic really came at me. It was the CDC. It's called the NHANES study. And it really 
was a survey that said that 20 to 46% of cancer survivors experience some level of emotional or mental irregularity at least once a month. Yeah. And that to me was like, that's crazy. And you know, I've interviewed now 200 cancer survivors. Yeah. Which then, I took 35 of their stories, told my own, it became a best-selling book, which to me, the impact of hope lasted. Yeah. But when I was trying to write this talk, I was like, what's mostly important to me? So I created a framework and it's called Aloha, which is in reference to the Hawaiian healing that I mentioned. And really it's this idea of A, the acronym is acknowledgement. Acknowledge where you are in your life. Don't pretend it's not there. Acknowledge it and be really clear as to what is happening. L stands for listening. Listen to that inner voice. Have those um, conversations with those different parts of the body. Yeah. Uh, I use a, a, a methodology in my coaching, which is called the three brains, the head, the heart, and the gut, and see what they resonate. Now, I'm not telling you to do this in public. Do this yeah. in the privacy of your own home. Mm -hmm. And see, because there's a lot of anecdotal evidence that says that those areas of the body, the head, heart, and gut, especially the heart, resonate some level of knowing, some level of consciousness, some level yes. of wisdom. And it's for us to do the job to figure out what that actually means to our lives. People can tell us, but you know, in coaching, the mm -hmm. greatest uh, integration of anything is when you figure it out for yourself. A coach uh -huh. can guide you, but you need to figure out for yourself because I can tell you 10 different things, but not one of them will stick unless you believe that that will stick with you. O stands for opening. So open yourself up to self-compassion and self-forgiveness. A lot of this work is about releasing what's not there. I ended up doing um, an event in Brooklyn about a week and a half ago. I was one of the attendees, four, 400 of us on a Saturday. Right. And he breath work. And a large portion of what he said was, you can't fill what you don't release. So right. if you want to pour into yourself, you have to pour out what's no longer serving you. H like stands that. for Thank you. H stands for harnessing. So harness the wisdom of all those body parts that I mentioned and all the uh, experiences that you've gleaned, everything that you thought that was most important to you in your life. And A is really like acting, act on that purpose. So it's called Aloha. Yeah. Uh, and I detail it a little bit more in my talk. I love it. You know, and it's funny because when things do go on in my life, those are the areas that I feel get affected the most is the head, the heart and the gut. And I, um, excuse me, I feel like um, I know things are going on just because I can feel it in those areas. And then when I look deep into myself and I meditate and I go deep down inside, I know exactly what's going on. And then it's, so then when someone knows exactly if they're able to meditate, is there any specific meditations, by the way, that you suggest to people if they feel something going on within themselves, how they can connect with their inner selves to really understand what's going on, to find that inner, inner stranger? Are there certain things they could do? Yeah, I think a large portion, you know, everyone wants to do uh, the most popular, right? Lotus position, <laughs> lighting yeah. incense chanting, humming, those things are wonderful modalities. But if you're someone who has no idea what this meditation is, you've heard about it, you can't sit still for even a minute, <laughs> just do it for 30 seconds. Just close yeah. your eyes and relax. It doesn't have to even be sitting down. You could be lying down. Now, you got to watch the fact that you don't fall asleep, but that's right. a learning, right? You have to sort of work yourself up there. <laughs> uh, but I would say it's really, you know, there's few schools of thought. So one of them is a blank canvas. Imagine nothing is happening. That's very difficult to do. Yeah. Some of them say, focus on one thing and let that grow. Another one is saying maybe a melody or phrase that can flourish within your mind. Yeah. I think really the key in all of it is just allowing yourself to be in the present moment. Yeah. Don't think about what's happening tomorrow. Don't think about what just happened yesterday. Just think about what's happening now. Right. And if you are stressed for time, if you schedule your meditation before a huge meeting, of course, you're going to be thinking about the meeting. Yeah. So I would suggest for, it's what I do. I wake right. up in the morning and besides my hygiene that I have to do, that we all have to do, mm -hmm. I meditate. I allow myself, I give myself that time yeah. and then I start my day. Cause if I don't do it, then it becomes um, like I didn't succeed at something. You know how they always say the first thing that you can succeed at every day is to make yeah. your bed. Mm -hmm. so the second thing is to meditate and meditate can just be as simple as just taking time out for yourself. Yeah. It could even be 
for you, if you're starting out, drinking that beautiful coffee or that tea that you want to drink in the morning and just having those moments of silence. Right. Because we're stimulated with so, there's so much activity that's being bombarded to us every day yes. that it's hard to ignore if you're not, if you're living in a, in a modern world. It really, right. really difficult. I actually was in India the whole month of December. I do a lot of work with National Geographic. Oh, so nice. yeah, so they took me out to India. So I experienced eight cities in 15 days. And I just remember thinking to myself, so my background is, is Indian. I have not been to India in 26 years, really wow. long. And I went to eight different cities and, oh my God, it was really, really eye-opening. And it felt like a once in a lifetime experience because I went to this one place called Varanasi, which is, which used to be called Banaras, which is known as the spiritual city of India. Yeah. And uh, I went to this place called Sarnath in Varanasi, which the Buddha gave his first sermon. So I was literally there in the place where the Buddha gave his first sermon. And then they said, Jesus, the lost years said he traveled India. I don't, you know, there. so it was just, but even when I was there, I could feel the energy, the heaviness, the history of the place. Yes. And I didn't know this, but they're saying that Varanasi is one of the oldest cities in, 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 in the world. Oh, really? Five, five to 6,000 years old. So oh, I could wow. actually feel like those little caverns and those little alleyways, you could feel that. And, you know, as you know, Varanasi is where they do the cremations, where they do the ghats, yes. where they have the cremations, because the Hindus believe that if you are cremated in in Varanasi and your your ashes are in the Ganges, they consider it the holy Ganges, yes. that you have attained enlightenment, that that is your last lifetime. And so I tell you this story because on the boat, when we were watching all of this happening, the cremations and the ceremonies, I felt a semblance of peace that I've never felt before. Wow. Even in my own cancer journey, I felt this, this level of acceptance and this level of um, an inner knowing. And yeah. I really connected not only with my inner stranger at that moment in time, because I think we're a culmination of the good, the bad, but I think mm -hmm. often we always look at the bad. Right. And at that moment, I saw the good and the gratefulness of being here, covering this and connecting to my ancestral roots and seeing a different side of India that I haven't seen and a different part of the world that I haven't seen. Yes. I think the key here is what um, one of uh, a uh, he's a UPenn professor. He talks about gratitude a lot. And he, he mentions that. It's great to make gratitude lists. And I think we should all do that because there's so much to be grateful for in a yes. complex world that we live in. But the key, he says, is when you write that list, ask yourself the question, why did that, why did that thing happen in my life? Why, yes. For example, if I'm grateful for the fact that I can pay rent, why am I grateful for that I can pay rent? I got an education or I'm working hard and I'm providing. He says that gives you a level of knowingness and that knowingness right. then carries forward. I like that. I like that. I feel gratitude is so important. I feel positivity and gratitude, I think is what got me through life, you know, and, and, and it also, it taught me how to look at life differently. So I don't it know it became, it became part of my lifestyle where I no longer looked at life and I had to, and had to like, you know, it was, um, I was always gracious and always, always had gratitude for everything that came into my life. Even when I went through chronic illnesses, I was grateful for it because I don't think I would be the person I am today. And I said that one time when I was speaking in front of a group of people and I probably they looked at me like I had three heads on my head. And, but I, I don't think I would be the same person because I was headed in a completely different direction, you know, before I got the chronic illness, when it got really out of control. And then I had to slow down and change my entire life. But the life I, I, I journeyed down was actually a better life for me as a person. So I, I no longer look at people the same way with a different pair of eyes. I look at people. I have gratitude for every little thing because I realize we take, we, we don't realize the littlest things in life when they're taken away from us, how much they meant to us until they're taken away. And we take things for granted. And I think we all, all are victims of that until they're taken away. And then you realize how, you know, all the little things in life matter. 
and you know and positivity if we if we if we have we have to focus on the positive because if we focus on the negative it's just gonna it's gonna bring us down it's gonna eventually destroy us but if we th focus on all the positive things in life it will bring us up and it will strengthen us. It will give us the courage, wisdom, strength, and hope that we need in order to move forward and in order to become the people that we we have become. And, and, and good energy brings good people and good people help other people grow. And, you know, and that's like, it's what, it's the energies you carry. I believe, you know, you, it's just because that's what the world is made of. Really. If you think about it, that world is made of energy without energy, we wouldn't exist. We are energy. We're just in a, in a bodily form, but we are energy. So if we have positive energy, that positive energy goes out and it draws in other positive energies. And I, I think it's I think those are important keys too. And I like that you brought up the word gratitude. And I like how you were taught to really think about the, you know the thing. Well, I had you know I paid the rent, but that you know I was able to pay rent because I got an education. And, you know, then you think about the education and then have gratitude because you had the ability, you know, why did you have the education? Why did you get the education? And then you go back and you start to really analyze all the little fragments of your life and really think about how lucky of a person you are. And then you kind of just, you know, I think that helps a lot mentally. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's really great that you reflected on that because I did a panel talk last week. And it was stage four cancer patients. Literally, this is the end for most of them, unfortunately. Yeah. But there's a level of acceptance that they had. And one of them actually, I mentioned it. And so then they went further. And I said, I don't know if I would ever consider my cancer stage three as being a blessing. I don't know if I would ever call it that. Yeah. Um, because, right, we think of a blessing as something that's bestowed on you. That's yes. good. But I'll be honest, the path that cancer showed me was this path. I'm doing the work of a survivor yeah. and interviewing 200 cancer survivors. And I'm building a commu an online community now soon. And I just did a best-selling book. And, and you know, I did a TEDx talk about my cancer journey and, yeah. and enveloping that. And I don't think that path would have shown because someone said, would you regret that? Would you, would you go back and if you could? If you, and I said, I, I don't think I would because yeah. I think it really shaped who I am. And you know, I think sometimes in life we have to just accept what we can control and what we can't control. Right. And I challenge some of them actually, even though they're stage four, because I understand how it how it is that process is. Yeah. I said, if I was to wave a magic wand and take away your cancer, it's gone. What would you be doing with your life? Right. And some of them didn't even know because they're so focused on surviving yeah. rather than living or thriving. Right. And so, and I said, make that list. And I said, is there anything on that list that you can do now, a little step that you can still do now, despite and in spite of your cancers, your stage four cancer um, diagnosis? And they were really moved and touched by that. And for yeah. me, it's really about allowing people to see that they're greater than their diagnosis. Yeah. And this was echoed in, in a large portion of my interviews and my book that cancer is not a death sentence. Right. No matter what illness or thing we face for you, it's epilepsy for you, for other people, it's some level of, um, you know, yeah. they just can't do anything in life or that the version of themselves is not greater and bigger. Yeah. But is it, or is that the limitation that we put on to, to ourselves? Is there something else that you could be searching for and looking for? And that's the work I do with my coaching clients because- not only do I help cancer survivors amplify their impact and tell their story, and I use my media, you know, media journalism to do that, because at the end of the day, your story is something that no one can take away from you. Yes. Someone can take away your medical privileges. Someone can take away your work. So, but no one can take away your story. You own that story. Yes. And for you to be able to tell that story in an impactful way, it's a book or a podcast, however my clients choose to do that. Yeah, that gives people the ability to say, oh, if they did it, I can do it. If they found it, I can find it. And yeah. if they can find it, then maybe other people can. as well. Right. Oh, I love that. I love that. And it is nobody can take away your story. And I, I think people do get fixated on the illness, so fixated that they can't see anything else but the illness. And that stops you from growing. You know, there, there's always where there's a will, there's a way. I truly believe that. 
you know, and I, I think our bodies give up when we give up mentally. I think our mind is such a, a strong, I, we don't really give credit to how strong mentally our mind has. And, you know, between the, I always believe the heart comes first and then the, and the mind. And, uh, but when you put those two together, if you're able to build a foundation, it's unbelievable what your inner self can do to your, to your health, to your, to your mental health, to your physical health, you can get through anything, you know, a lot of the times. And yes, you know, people who go through stage four cancer, you know, many of them might not make it back, but you know, what do they have? You know, if they, if you could take away that magic wand, then what do they have? And they became so fixated the whole entire time that they didn't really probably get to appreciate some of the things they could have appreciated. You know, it's all how I guess we look at things, how we deal with things, you know. Yeah. I mean, look, at the end of the day, I, I told them, I said, cancer is a physical thing. It's physically mm. happening to you. Right. And doctors and your care team, they're wonderful at that aspect. But yes. that's only one aspect. Yes. It's only one aspect exactly. of you living in this world. Think about how crazy this is. We're living on a, a, a giant rock floating in space. <laughs> it's insane. It is you insane. Know? And so you think to yourself, well, okay, am I much more than just this physical body that's inhabiting within me? Yeah. And, you know, I tell the story of, of, of my TEDx talk and I'll give a little snippet in the beginning. Yeah. I start my TEDx talk with, have you ever struggled? to recognize your own reflection. Right. And that's a powerful statement because for me, I used to think to myself, like, am I more than just this physical shell that I see? Yes. And I know this is going to the realm of woo woo and all. It doesn't have to be that complicated. It could be yeah. as simple as just mining for yourself what that actually means to you. Right. And when I go and have these conversations, these coaching conversations with my clients, you know, Oftentimes I rely on my training, this idea of positive psychology, like, okay, how can I manage the situation despite my challenges? Yeah. How can I have self-regulation and reclaim that inner strength by creating, oh, coaches love this and you know this, vision, not a yes. goal, but a vision. A vision is how do you want to feel? How do you want to be? How do you want people to perceive you? How do you want to perceive yourself? Yes. And that's the key. The key is to see yourself outside of yourself. So yes. a little clue, the inner stranger is something that's beyond you yes. because a stranger can be a friend right. or a stranger can challenge you to see yourself as better. Right. Very true. Very true. And I think sometimes we, we are most affected sometimes by unbiased opinions by others, you know, and, uh, and, and I, th I think we could also get a lot of help by people who are unbiased, don't know you that well, just know you from what you've told them but they have, they have the biggest impact because they're not judgmental and they're open-minded and they're listening. And like you said, they're letting you come up with the answers, not even realizing it because we all have the answers within us. So sometimes we, we are blocked in certain in areas of our life and we can't see those answers. Yeah. And even as a media journalist, like I'm there and people are like, wait, you just interviewed Venus Williams and you just interviewed Ice-T and you just <laughs> interviewed, aren't you nervous? I'm like, no, they're real people, humans. Yeah. Like, and some of them have bigger problems than we do, right? right. Like Venus Williams, people see her as the epitome of sports. Right. But she was very candid. She launched a wellness brand. She's like, I'm yeah. going through digestive issues. It's hindering my ability to perform. And she's like, if I'm not vocal about this and I don't tell people about it, then they're suffering in silence. So yes. I'm here to offer another avenue what helped me, what healed me. And I really thought that that particular aspect of what she was trying to create was really powerful because it's yeah. saying what people perceive you, right? We live in this Instagram world where people are curating a TikTok world where people are curating things yes. for you. What's really happening behind the scenes? And I really exactly. enjoyed that. And, you know, you started to show off by saying that this weekend or I'm supposed to go cover the Oscars. Like that to most people would be like, whoa. But I tell people all the time, like, going through what I've been through, you know, it's just, it's an icing on the cake, yeah. but it's really about for me and what my editor trusts me is what's the real answer to what we're all longing for, searching yeah. for, trying to heal from, what is that real answer? And right. I live in this world of objectivity because I've been through what can happen to you. That's horrible. Yeah. And I've been through now on the other side, nine years in remission, thankfully yes. to see 
what the possibilities can be. Now, I don't yes. know what's going to happen a year from now. It could be really bad, but I live in this moment yes. of saying that I can do what I mm -hmm. need to do. And I have the strength to see and have the vision. Yeah. To make it happen and real. Yeah. I worked for um, the media and I worked with a lot of celebrities and stuff like that, but I never looked at them as celebrities. I always look at them as just regular people. And I don't know. I never could understand why people idolize them so much because they were just like us, you know, they, their job was to entertain, but behind the cameras, behind the scenes, they were just like you and me going through life, going through obstacles, going through their daily lives, you know, and um, yes, some of them may have, have had bigger egos than others, but they all had regular lives, you know, and uh I, I, I always looked at them as it was their job. It wasn't, it was no more than that. And the reason why I was, ex I was excited for you for, you know, being able to cover the global awards was because you got to that point where people had trusted your abilities enough to send you there. It wasn't the fact that you you're going to the global awards. It was the fact that you have the ability and the capabilities to be able to your, your knowledge of writing and being able to take your thoughts and cl collaborate them into something beautiful where other people trust what you say, value what you say. Therefore, they're sending you to there. You know, that's what I look at. You know, I look at it as like, wow, you've achieved, you've gotten to this level of achievement where people look at you as not just a writer, not just a reporter, but you are a valued instrument in the world of journalism. To me, that is a huge accomplishment because I've been in journalism for all my life and I feel that's a great accomplishment, you know? Oh, thank you. Yeah, and, and I tell people all the time, like my 20-some-year-old self, I'm in my early 40s, by the way, or mid-40s, <laughs> uh, just had a birthday. I'll um, switch your, your, my... <laughs> your birthdays with you because mine's coming up, but I'll switch oh, numbers. <laughs> okay, there you go. We're similar in that aspect. Probably my 20 year old self would probably be like, what? Like, the, like, ego, yeah. all ego, all ego, all about me, 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 me. Yeah. It's really not. You know, um, when I did my TEDx talk, and I'll give a little preview for your audiences uh, listening, um, I was chosen. So there were only 10 of us chosen. Yeah. There was over 300 applications. They chose me to go first. So I knew I had to set the bar, set yeah. the standard. I mentioned to you earlier, or maybe I didn't mention to your uh, listeners, but Doing a TEDx talk was overcoming a fear of mine. The fear yeah, wasn't yeah. about talking, the fear about people staring at you. So there was 225 right. people in the audience in Raleigh, North Carolina. And I go up, I did one minute of it, mic issues, come all the way back behind the scene, you know, stage, get out there, two minutes, another mic issue. The, the organizer runs down. She goes, listen, this is not live stream. This is film live, but it's not live stream. Right. Go back, we'll fix it. I come back out. I do my whole 10 minutes, no mic problems, no issues. I got through it. And I will say after the second time, I was frazzled. I like lost my place in what my talk was about. Yeah. Because that, that's what happens. And after I gave my talk, thankfully, I got a standing ovation um, or rousing ovation. And um, a guy came up to me. He's like, what you did on there was amazing. I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, what I saw was like, you were up at bat in a baseball game. Strike one, not your fault, but strike one. Strike two, not your fault. Strike three, you hit it out of the park. It was a home run. And he's like, what you showed was resilience up there. Before you yeah. talked about resilience and your story, you showed it. You didn't, you didn't, you didn't wince. You didn't yell. You didn't scream. You didn't look angry. You were just yeah. cool, cool, calm and collected. And I looked at him and I said, yeah, you don't know this about me, but I'm a New Yorker. I <laughs> said, um, I've been through the dot-com crash in the early 90s when yeah. I was just out of college. I've been through 9-11. Yeah. You know, I've been through my own personal journey. I went through a business um uh, uh a financial situation that left, you know, left me financially like in ruin. Yeah. And, and I've been through my own cancer journey. I said, that's not gonna stop me. I said, I've been right. through too much. I said, if they wanted me to do 20 more times, I would have done 20 more times. I came there to do a job. Right. And I think that's a very key point. I'm not saying that I survived cancer because I was the strongest. And yeah. you know, in the cancer world, people are always little hesitant of using the word fighter. Yeah. All I know is I knew for myself that I was worthy yeah. of something greater than my illness. I was worthy of seeing myself as finding some way to find healing and yes. healing. And I think I mentioned this in our first podcast session. Doesn't 
always take place in a in a chemo bed? Does it right. always take place in the medical office? It does. That's the majority of where healing can yeah. happen. But healing takes place in those small moments. Could yeah. be when you're sleeping. Could be when you're lying. Could be when you're so much in pain that you don't know how to even overcome this. Right. Healing occurs in all ways and means. And for me, I wanted to find that answer for myself. Yeah. Because my healing is different from other people's healing. Yes. It's my job because it's always an inside job. Yes. I love that. I love that. This has been an amazing journey. I, I I commend you. You've come such a long way. Now, your book, what is your book titled? Sure. So the book is called I Survived Cancer, and here is how I did it. 35 cancer survivors share their journey. You can find it on Amazon and all the, I also have an audiobook accompaniment as well. Just uh, you can go to my website, which is saviopclementi.com. Uh, there you can uh, also, if you're interested in in one-on-one in -on -one coaching, uh, you know, options are there. You can sign up for my weekly newsletter. I go into the head, heart, and gut. I talk about a concept or something that I've discovered. And I'm just really honest about how that can help other people understand their own life and where they are. Um, and also to a large degree, I'm building a uh, an online community as well that's it. launching in the next couple of weeks. So I'm excited about that. But that's all on SaviaPClementi.com. Or you can go to any of my socials. I'm on all of the platforms, TikTok, Instagram, um, Twitter, at The Human Resolve is my handle for all those social media sites. I love that. Now, if you had to take everything that we talked about today and you had to sum, sum it up, how would you, what are certain things you'd like to emphasize to some of the listeners today? It's really something that, how I ended my TEDx talk, Stacey, to know thyself is to heal thyself. It's an ancient saying, but it's so true because yeah. in order to understand the world, you have to understand yourself. It's, 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 it's incumbent upon us. It's pertinent upon us. This world is filled with so much creature comforts and so much things that are shiny, shiny yeah. objects, as I call them, or so many things that we want to accomplish and yeah. get and have and hold and cherish and embrace and wonderful things. Right. But our job here on this planet, in this world, in this time, is to really understand how can we make a contribution to ourselves and to the world at large. And if you're yes. not someone who cares about making a contribution to the world at large, that's your prerogative. You don't have to. Right. We have to do the work because we're all in here trying to figure out why are we living the way we're living? Why is this pain happening to us? How can I get to that next level mm -hmm. of relief? Yes. And I think it's important to under, under um, score that particular point to know thyself is to heal thyself. Yes. And there's so many ways to know yourself. There's so many tools and resources online and in person that we can find ways to do that, to honor that aspect of ourselves. Can you name a few a few tools to people just so they have an idea of certain things they could look into that might be helpful for them? Sure. So beyond watching my TEDx talk, <laughs> I know that's a shameless plug. No, beyond that, uh, beyond the Aloha methodology that I mentioned, beyond meditation that I mentioned, simple meditation, beyond this idea of breath work, you could use the box breathing technique, two, three breaths in and out. You can also do something that I start every coaching session with, which is breathing into the different body parts of yourself, taking mm -hmm. a few minutes to just slowly breathe in and out on all the areas of yourself. It tells me yes. a lot of people tell me that when I start that off, they're like, I'm in a whole different zone right now. I'm yeah. totally connected with you. Um, I think another thing could be journaling. Like mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be like <laughs> journal books of like the yesteryear where you're writing like your <laughs> deep, dark secrets. Uh -huh. It could just be what, what happened today. Yes. What transpired today? What am I grateful today? Right. What didn't go so well today? What right. can I do better today? Could just yes. be as simple as that. Um, I would I would say that you could uh, reframe this idea of to do's mm -hmm. to want to do's. So it doesn't have to be I have to do it. It has to be I want to do it or right. get to do it. Because if you get to do something, then you feel, oh, I have the ability to do that. Yeah. rather than feeling I have to do that. So it right. changes that whole aspect of self. I would also say some level of connection with higher source. With, for you, if that's prayer, or if that's affirmation, or if that's chanting, or if that's humming, mm -hmm. or if that's just going into yoga class or Pilates class and just bending into a pretzel, yeah, <laughs> whatever it, it is that allows you to reset, then that allows you to reset. 
And I think lastly, above all of those is really about being kind to yourself. Yes. I'll be honest. I really wasn't kind to myself with cancer. I saw it as a challenge. I was focused. A lot of people, my dad was like, you want me to come to, you know, for you to get chemo? I said, dad, you staring at me for five hours <laughs> is not going to help me. It's going to make me feel like I'm, I'm antsy because I'm going to try to like make you feel comfortable. Yeah. So what he did was, you know, he would pick me up from the, from the six rounds. Right. Which was really nice. So I think it's this idea of just being really kind to yourself. And how does that start? That starts from being self-compassionate and self-forgiveness. Yes. Like I messaged, what you can't pour out, you can't pour in. So yes. you got to let those things go. So I, I would say those are a few tools that they could use. I, I love those tools. And, and, and those are the tools that I used to myself to actually get forward in life and to, and to move forward. And for forgiveness, do you have a couple of suggestions for people? Because that's something that people have a very hard time forgiving themselves. They hold on to the past. They hold on to their mistakes. They hold on to what others do and they can't let go. What's your, before we go, can you tell us a couple of suggestions for people who are, don't know how to forgive themselves or don't know how to forgive others? Because we don't have to verbally hear the person say, I'm sorry. We have to be able to forgive them for their actions or forgive ourselves from the mistakes we've made. But one way or another, we need to let go after we go through the process of forgiveness. So how do we do that? Yeah. So in Ho'oponopono, which is what I mentioned, there's yeah. a phrase that people repeat over and over again. It's, I love you. I forgive you. It's really about honoring something greater than your mistakes, something yes. greater than what just transpired or what has transpired in, in your life. So I think the key element there is really instead of letting it ruminate within your head and mm -hmm. in your heart, write it down. Mm -hmm. Write down all the things that you perceive that mm -hmm. someone has wronged you or that you had maybe wronged someone else because you just didn't know better or you just didn't do better. So I think that's the starting point. The second thing with self-forgiveness is, and Oprah said it best, so I'm going to take a little bit from her from the 90s, forgiveness is not about the other person always. It's yes. about yourself. Yes. Can you forgive what, what transpired? Are you able to let that go? Yes. And letting go doesn't mean letting go and forgetting because you also have to realize if you forget, then you're going to repeat Yes. So it's honoring and forgiving what happened to you, but not forgetting because then you're going to repeat what transpired. Right. I think the third thing above all of it is really, and this is for people who believe in something greater than themselves. I, right. I know a few people who are atheists who don't believe in anything greater than that. And that's their right to believe that. Right. But I think it's also about creating that inner peace and giving right. it to something greater than yourself. Saying, right. I surrender to this particular pain or this yeah, particular yeah. situation, I surrender it to something greater than myself. Right. Because like I mentioned, we're floating on this giant rock yes. in space, billions of us. Yes. And we can't figure out the mysteries of life and death. I mm -hmm. think that's for us to unravel, mm -hmm. for us to work out. Yes. And for us to understand. Because exactly. at the end of the day, it's really about understanding ourselves and the world around us. A hundred percent. Oh, I love when I talk to you. I just love it. You have such great knowledge. And I love, you know, when, when people, if they want to go to your TED Talk, do they go to your website? Because I see the intro to your, to your TED Talk there. Can they see the TED Talk there? Or do they have to go to your YouTube channel to see it? Sure. So they can do either one of two things. You can go on Google and type seven minutes to wellness, how to love your inner stranger. You can type my name, but I'm just warning you. <laughs> I fill up a lot because I put about 10 articles per week. And I know I'm doing all these different things. And, uh, and I'm launching season four of my podcast finally, because I put it on hold for my TEDx talk. Yay. But if they go to Savio P. Clemente, C-L-E-M-E-N-T-E.com. Uh, and I'm sure you can have it in the show notes. You could scroll down. And there's a link to my TEDx talk is as well there and every other thing that I do, my book and yeah. my you know newsletter and my community that's starting. And uh, so it's, I would say that's probably the best is just to go to that website. It's there. Yeah. Uh, the initial video that you see uh, is my speaker reel um, that just got launched actually last week. Um, so I'm excited about that. I yeah. saw that. I love it. It's beautiful. Thank I you. saw that. Yes. I appreciate it. 
I know we've known each other a long time and I've always honored your work and I always honored everything you did because I love you, you think very similar to I do. We we're on a we we do things a little bit differently, but our our thoughts are online with one another. And I love how much you've been able to overcome and like myself, you know, it took time, but I learned to love myself. I learned to accept myself. I overcame the obstacles in my life and I was able, just like you, we were able to move forward. And my biggest gift was that the first thing I wanted to do was help others because when I was going through the rough patches in my life, people came out of the woodwork to help me. And so the first thing in my, in my head was I need to help others. I, you know, once I unraveled how to, how to help myself, then I wanted to teach the world because I felt like that was my calling, you know, that, you know, and I think, you know, it's funny because when you wrote your book, you interviewed people with cancer. When I wrote my book, I interviewed people with epilepsy and I put those stories in my book and, and even I had a, a person write to me and they, they found my book in Barnes and Nobles. They read my book and they said they followed my regiment and they said that, you know, they thanked me because they were on the verge of suicide and they said it saved their life. And I think that's when the light bulb went off. I realized my calling and I realized how powerful the wisdom of words really is, whether you verbally say it, whether you write it on paper, you know, the words we that come out of our mouths, the words we put on paper can have such an impact on other people's lives. And I thought that was such a powerful tool that needed to be performed in the right way and how we could save so many lives and help so many people by the gift that was given to us. Yeah. And you I, have the gift. Oh, I, I appreciate that. But I think what's also common about both of us and people ascribe these labels to us, right? We're leaders. We do yeah. leadership work. We're leadership this and leadership that. And leaders are just people that you follow, but you follow them. Why? Because they've done the work. They believe in the cause mm -hmm. and they're able to allow you to see yourself because yes. they see themselves as that way. As yes. Well. So I think that's a, a very important point to anyone listening. You don't have to be this highfalutin person like yeah. you or me that's doing all these crazy things in the world. It could be as simple as your family. It could be yeah. as simple yeah. as your household. It could be as yeah. simple as your community. Yes. Simple as your congregation. Whatever it is, it doesn't have to be this lofty thing. If it is, yeah. wonderful. Join us. But yeah. it can just be about you being that example for yourself. Right. So that others can see that example in themselves. Exactly. Exactly. I, this has been an honor, Savio. I I love having you on the show. And thank you so much for coming on this show. And is there anything else you'd like to say to the audience before we, we go? Probably the last thing I want to say is because of the complex world we live in, right? There's wars happening. There's dissension happening. People are not agreeing with each other. Yes. People are violently opposed to this and opposed to that. I think I want to just leave people with what I talked about with those stage four cancer patients who really at this point have no other recourse. They know they know it's going to be end for them soon. Yeah. The idea of legacy. Mm -hmm. How do you want your life to be perceived by others? Yes. Not in a judgmental way, right. but in a way that allows them to feel that they connected with you. Because yes. isn't it isn't what the purpose of all of us here is to do is to connect with one another? Yes. At some level, even if we have problems. Yes. There's some level of connection there. Yeah. And maybe the key for us is to work it out. Right. And I will just probably say this one last point because, you know, I'm a science person, but there was this episode and I'm dating myself here back in the 90s, X-Files. And there was this one uh, episode and it always sticks by me in everything that I do where Mulder, Fox Mulder, he was mm -hmm. one of the characters, ends up unraveling a, a Janiya, a female genie. Yeah. And basically gives him all these wishes, you know, and he, you know, he messes up on the first one because he asked for peace and peace was just silence. He's like, wait, that's not what I said. He goes, that's not what you meant. <laughs> anyway, last thing is he was trying to write this whole big thing like on the computer and trying to make it all perfect and everything. And his partner, Scully, comes in and she goes, what are you doing? And he's like, you don't remember like not being here on the face of the earth? And she's like, no. And she and so she's like, what are you doing? And he's like, I'm writing the perfect wish and everything. He's like, you know, peace on earth and, you know, democracy for everybody and all this. And she goes, and he's like, what's wrong? That That's going to help everybody. And she goes, maybe that's the purpose of why we're all here, to work it out. 
Yeah. Maybe that's why we're here. And I was like, wow, it was so profound even back then for me. That yeah. It's still stuck by me 25 years later. Yeah. Because I think that's the key. We're all looking for the solution, but the solution always resides within us. First yes. Because we are a reflection of everything that we get and everything that we give. Right. I love it. Oh my God. That's wonderful. Savio, thank you so much for coming on this show. This has been amazing. I really appreciate it. I hope you, you'll you come on again and then we could continue our talks, but this has been amazing. And thank you for everything you, you've shared today and congratulations on all your accomplishments. I, I really, I truly honor you and all the work you've done. Thank you. Thanks, Stacey. Thank you. You have a great day. Yes, you too.